members in the congregation, maybe two of you that would be willing to share a little bit about uh, what you received in the conference. Would you raise your hand, please, in the balcony? Uh, I think probably if any of you are here, you're over in the other building. Sir? Okay, if you're in the Family Life Center, and okay, come down from the balcony. There's someone up there. Come on down. Okay, come on up, brother. And the one from the balcony up there, okay. Yeah, we'd like to, um, okay. Pastor said we'd have three or four. Since he's driving the ship, we're going to have three or four. Okay, is there someone over in this area? Come on up, Pastor. Come on up. Okay, come on up, brother. Um, all right, come on. That's three. Pastor said three or four. Someone pointing back there. Okay, where are you? Come on up uh, in the balcony. Come on. Come on down. Okay. Praise God. Let me just say that uh, it's our joy and our pastor's heart for pastors. Many of, uh, many of us don't realize the burden that these guys are under. But let me tell you something. It isn't just pulpit. It isn't just pulpit. This thing weighs on, on these gentlemen 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days of the year. It's an awesome responsibility to be responsible for some of God's people. It's an awesome responsibility. And um, one of the reasons that we want to have these conferences is to, uh, uh, to allow these folks to come here and to just get away from the pressures of the ministry and uh, let us love on them and pour something into their lives. Uh, um, not that we know how to do things. That's not uh, why we, we invited you folks here. Um, we, we really, you know, we, we're just fellow pilgrims, but we wanted to, you to come here and just come aside for a little bit and allow us to, to love on you and allow our church to love on you and, and just let us pour some of the love of God into your lives. And so I hope this happened for you, and we'd like to, for you to share with our congregation and give them some feedback. Okay, and uh, so uh, tell us who you are and where you're from, brother. My name is Jürgen Schneider. I come from Germany, a small town near Frankfurt, and uh, I am pastor of a church that's crying for revival, that we, that we feel here, that we like here, that we love here. And we, I, I want to praise the Lord for, for every second that I, I has been here. And I'm so much blessed by the, by the touching of the Holy Spirit. i so much blessed by, the, by your hospitality from, from everybody, from the love we, we, we met in the Bible school. It, it touched our heart so much, and, and we, we pray to the Lord that he will make it possible that we can take it with home, that we, we can, can put it in our church, that the Spirit of the Lord moves through the people, that he touches the hearts of the people, that he renew it, that, that he put away the dust and the smog and all the things who... who who let, who let us see what is necessary, what the Lord wants to do for us. And I have one thing on my heart, and I, I want to do it. Let's together bless Israel yes. and pray for the peace in the walls of Jerusalem. Yes. God bless all Jewish people in the world. Yes. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Many of you may not uh, realize it, but God is beginning to uh, stir uh, Germany. God's going to pour His Spirit out on that great nation. He is. He's going to pour His Spirit out. Hunger such as this, God's going to honor that. The Scripture says, if we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we shall be filled. God will not fail you, brother, nor will He fail your nation in, in satisfying that hunger. Tell us who you are, Pastor, and where you're from. My name is Kevin. I'm from Huntington Beach, California. Great. Is it okay to be speaking up here without a tie on? Absolutely. <laughs> and we, we got a tie on pastor today. Can you believe that? 
Well, I came here to check this place out, and I got checked out. <laughs> I, I got a check up from the neck up. And then the Holy Spirit really checked me out. <laughs> and uh, the Lord has really changed my heart. I think... I thought I knew a lot, and now I know that the greatest thing is just to love the Lord. And I repented last night, and I was here all week long, and it took me until Saturday night. God knew how stubborn I'd be. So I want to just thank all of you here for just showing your love and for praying for me a long time ago. And I appreciate it. My son got saved here, by the way, last July, and we're hoping that he gets to come here to the School of Ministry, so. I know, I know who this guy is, but I'm gonna let him, let him tell you and let, let him tell you where he's from. Hallelujah. Uh, my name is Dan Bryles, and I'm from Kingman, Arizona. <laughs> You got, you got some here. Praise God. And uh, this is my seventh visit here to Brownsville yes. and my first Sunday morning. And I wanted to stay over Sunday morning because I wanted to, to see if, you know, we were in the revival services and we see, you know, a lot of visitors come in. We spent a lot of time out in the line out there. And um, praise God, I'm just becoming a regular here, but I wanted to see what the Sunday morning crowd was like to see the people here and I want to say how much as a pastor how much we appreciate your hospitality your goodwill to us the friendly faces you don't know how humbling it is to go into these places and the people are applauding you because of you being a pastor and I want to say because we're out there in the battlefield I bless God because our church has been in revival and Brother Kerry's been there, and he knows our church is uh, seeking God, but there's more. Yes. I feel like even in this, uh, this conference, uh, I, first time I came up here, I was like the prophet. I got down ankle deep, been up to the knees, slowly getting up to the waist. I feel like I need more and more and more of God. And I praise God because of the uh, Brownsville Revival School of Ministry. Yes. I tell you what, that is a key there. As uh, you heard, our young people that are coming here, they're getting involved, they're hungry. Uh, my, my daughter went to Evangel College, and, and bless her heart, uh, it's a good school. Uh, they love the Lord there, but there's a lot of compromises there. And when I was out there yesterday, uh, the other day when uh, Michael Brown was sharing, they're not allowing compromise, they're going whole hog for God, praise God. And I tell you what, praise God. This is the key, is our young people. I encourage you pastors to invest in this ministry. I've seen the fruit of it. I've watched it. I came out here expecting. I've been receiving. And I just praise God, and I thank you, Pastor, and pastor for your hospitality. Praise, praise God. God. Amen. Let me just say to the pastors that send your young people here that we are so honored that you've done that. And we take the stewardship very seriously of uh, watching over them while they're here and, and uh, preparing them for the work we're unto God's called them. Uh, I'll tell you something funny about this guy. The, the first night of the, the revival, I, um, I watched him uh, as he uh, guided his wife back to the, the car. She was totally out of it and he was, um, he was sort of driving her down the sidewalk to get her to the car. And um, it was funny because last night as I was getting in my car, I watched her driving him down the sidewalk to get him in the car. <laughs> I say, I have uh, uh, two churches that I've pastored. Both churches have students here at the Brownsville Revival School of Ministry. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm Irv Goodman. I'm an evangelist from Fort Collins, Colorado, but I'm pastoring a church in the spirit, a church that's going to open up on October 28th of the year 2000 in Jerusalem, my brothers Praise and sisters. God. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> it's going to be called the International Liberty, Truth, and Love World Outreach Center, and I, I have never felt so at home in a church 
as I have had, as I have felt all the times that I've been here. And I, I thank you, John. I, I, uh, I've met Richard. I've met John McCormick, Lila. So many people, it's just the love and the humility that I've always wanted to see in the church is here as evidence that the Lord truly is here. And I, and I so look forward. I'm, in my next newsletter, I'm telling everybody uh, to get in touch with this ministry, with the Brownsville Revival. I, 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 it's, it's my heart to have an open highway from Jerusalem to Pensacola because I, I've been preaching for all these years. I'm from a Jewish background, Jewish on both sides. I'm the first one uh, that I know of uh, uh, all the way up to Abraham, uh, or all the way up to when Jesus walked, who has ever received Jesus Christ Jesus. in my family. And, and, and I've been preaching though for all these years that in Jesus there's no Jew, no Gentile. And so many of my messianic brothers and sisters, my Jewish brothers and sisters, once they got they get born again, you know, they get into their own fellowships and the wall is built back up that Jesus by his blood tore down. But in Jerusalem, the Lord is sending me to get out of the way Praise and have our Father have his way as he has his way here. So I just Praise thank God. you for the opportunity to be here. Amen. Amen. Well, hang on just a minute. Would you stand, please? We, uh, how many ministers do we have here that's left over from the conference? Spouses, ministers and spouses. God bless you. I knew there's a lot of you out there. There's a lot of you over in the other building. I don't know how many we have in the other building today, but we're so happy to have you. Um, pastor from Germany. What's your name again? Jürgen Schneider. He's Schne Schneider. Yeah. And this is Goodman. And you wanted to pray for Jerusalem? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Isn't that something? You know, uh, it's amazing how the Lord works things out. Uh, you know, the Germans um, and the Jewish situation back during Adolf Hitler's time, how tragic. But look at 1999 and look on this platform and you see a Jew and a German standing side by side. Isn't that wonderful? God bless them. Bless them, Lord. I hope I can explain it to you. Uh, Pastor John Kilpatrick said it, said uh, the German history is uh, so badly in the front of the Lord. And uh, our church and a few members went in September this year to a town called Wiechem. You all will know this town as Auschwitz. And this was not a concentration camp. This was a fabric, an exactly planned fabric to kill six million of Jewish people. The German people killed their sex, six million of Jewish sisters, brothers, Childs, and most of them hasn't been killed in the gas camps. They has been killed for sickness, hunger, and hopeless. And I want to pray to the Lord Hallelujah. that He He gives grace for His own people. That say that say, see, Jesus Christ, Sir Messias, her Savior. Lord, I pray to you, give grace, give grace for your people. Save your people all over the world. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Let's, let's, um, by the way, those of you that were not uh, privileged to be here for the conference and you wasn't privileged to hear Mike Brown speak about Israel, man, listen, I want you to get that tape. That is a treasure. Mike Brown spoke in the morning service at this conference 
concerning Israel and how it's tied in, the church's love for Israel, how it's tied in with the coming of the Lord, it is, I, I couldn't recommend anything more highly. It's phenomenal. And um, I see God doing such great things. I, I see just, it, it's mind-blowing what I'm seeing the Lord doing. And, and to see this right here is so precious. Wow. Let's pray for Israel this morning. How many of you, <clears throat> how many of you will be willing today to bless Israel? Let's bless Israel. Matter of fact, why don't you just raise your hands right now and let's just bless Israel and Jerusalem and the Jewish people, Jews. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we bless, we bless Israel. We bless the Jews, the Orthodox Jews, the unorthodox Jews, the Jews in Jerusalem, the Jews in Israel, the Jews in America, and the Jews all over the world, we bless them. Oh God, let the Spirit of the Lord fall upon Israel and the Jews. Raise them up, oh God. Raise them up. Can these bones live again? Yes, 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 yes. Let the breath from the nostrils of God flow in those bones and raise up Israel, Lord, in our time like a mighty army marching through the land. Let us see the end time sign, Lord. Let us with our own eyes before your coming see the end time sign and fulfillment of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you. Remain standing for a moment. I want to say today, too, to Brownsville how much we um, appreciate all of you that volunteered and helped us in this pastor's conference. Listen, probably one of the most important things you can do uh, for your church and in the kingdom of God all year is to volunteer in the two pastor's conferences that we have. We have them in April and we have them in November. And these conferences and your kindness and warmth and generosity, hospitality, means more than I can tell you. And these ministers and their spouses that come and they are touched and blessed, sometimes they seem to be more touched by your hospitality and kindness and reception of them than they are by the preaching or anything else that's done in the services. Sometimes that means more to them. And I knew today whenever some of these preachers came up, I didn't know who was going to come up, but I knew that somebody was going to say when they came up, that it was this brother here, that he said um, how much he appreciated whenever they walked in over there to be fed in the Family Life Center, how they appreciated being applauded and clapped for. Because preachers are, are used to being blasted. They're used to living under satanic attack, and they're used to gossip and division and slander and all kinds of things like that. Preachers are not really used to people applauding them and loving on them. And so, Brownsville, I bless you this morning. I bless you for the Spirit of the Lord to refresh you and to strengthen you and to return the blessings that you put on these men and women of God to bring it back on your head multiplied seven times. Lord, bless Brownsville. Strengthen them. And Lord, give us more volunteers for the next conference in April. Let people right now begin to mark that on their calendar that they're going to take off and they're going to come and pour themselves in that conference in April and November of next year and let God use them to minister to your chosen ministers. In Jesus' name. We love you, Brownsville. And I want to say, too, today, while I'm thinking about it, I appreciate, come here a minute, Carrie. I appreciate so much Carrie Robertson. And Carrie, uh, Carrie, since, uh, since revival, go ahead. God bless you. Good. Since revival broke out at Brownsville, since revival broke out of Brownsville, all of our lives went in a tailspin, and so many changes took place. A lot of changes took place in my life and our ministry. And when I needed somebody to come in here and help me with this church and help me run the church and day-to-day -day business of the church and, and uh, carrying on a function of pastoral duties that I just was not able to do by myself anymore, 
when I brought in Carrie Robertson is one of the best moves ever made. And uh, God gave us uh, Carrie and Shirley Robertson, and we thank God for them, and we love them. And I just wanted to say today publicly how much I appreciate all he does for this church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I want you to turn around right now before you're seated, and uh, I want you to look at the person beside you, and I want you to say to them, it's good to have you at Browns. Praise the Lord. I'm going to give you a little bit of time to get those cards because when you all are given yours, you can stand up. Yeah, that's good. Isn't this a good looking bunch up here this morning? You all would clap a lot more if you knew how hot these robes are on Sunday. These people are faithful. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm so proud of them. Well, you've given your card up. You can stand. That way I'll know where we are. So remain seated till you've given your card. All right. You ready to worship the Lord?
That's a good song to take my message on right there. Glory. Hallelujah. I want you, if you will, today to, um, how many of you brought your Bibles? Hold them up. I want to see them. I see some 357s, 9 millimeters. I see an Uzi out there in the platform. That's some good Bibles. I'm having to carry my family Bible now that I'm older. 
I had to forsake my evangelistic Bible. I'm going to leave that to Steve and his contacts. I don't wear contacts. I'm a man. <clears throat> Hallelujah. He ain't here today. <laughs> I'm going to read three verses, three different places in the Bible as my text today, and then I'm going to be going. Hey, I've only got seven pages of notes. Well, I'll declare. Y'all don't want me to preach long, do you? I'm going to be going to um, 1 Samuel. Uh, for After I get past these texts, I'm going to be going to 1 Samuel, Acts, and um, 1 Samuel again, and then 2 Samuel. I've been ministering on the subject of, of accepting adversity, and today we'll com conclude the series on accepting adversity. This is the best one in my opinion. This is the best of the three. This one means a lot to me today. All of you preachers that are left over, all of you ministers that are left over after the conference, I feel like this will really minister to you. Um, this really helps express my heart, what I have chosen to preach on today. I've been in a, a series on the subject of accepting adversity. The Lord says, resist not evil. And um, through the things that we go through, through the adversities that we go through, God always gives instruction and wisdom. And it only comes through adversity. Matter of fact, I'm going to read a scripture here this morning in James, and I want to bring it all in context. I don't want to paint you a picture of just a little bit of this, this text in James, but I want to paint you a full picture in a moment when I get to that, that will show you about adversity and wisdom. God gives wisdom when you go through adversity. If you embrace it and accept it, if you resist it and you become stubborn and stiff-necked when adversity comes and you try to wiggle out of adversity or escape it, it leaves a stubborn string of failures in your life that you look back on with regret. But God always helps us in adversity, and in every trial and temptation will always make a way of escape. If you embrace it, but if you resist it, uh, it doesn't make any promises about a way of escape because you're trying to do it your own way with your own method, and that's just not God's way. Um, I could say a lot, but I need to get right into my message because I'll say it all there, hopefully. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 18. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18. This is a very familiar passage of Scripture. It says, In everything, give thanks. Why? For it is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Look at that one more time. Verse 18. In everything. Now, it doesn't say for everything. You don't give thanks necessarily for everything because it's sadistic for us to, you know, um, to want these kind of things and to invite these kind of things. But when they come, the Bible says, whatever situation you find yourself in, in everything, give thanks. Why? For it is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, not somebody else, but you. Now, Proverbs 2.11, this is just a quick little scripture that I want to point out to your attention. I like this scripture. I've went to it many times in my life, and I'd like you to remember this and go to it in some dark days in your life. It says, in Proverbs 2.11, it says, Discretion shall preserve you, and understanding shall keep you. Friend, look this way. I think, it's, I think it's within all of us that we want to understand what's happening. 
And if you embrace adversity, God will give you understanding. But it won't be probably a major burst of revelation. It will be a gradual, layer by layer, sheet by sheet, revelation that God will give you as you're going through it, where he will give you understanding. But the understanding will not come as a package wrapped up where he hands it to you and says, here. But the understanding will be learned and it will be done layer by layer, precept, precept, line upon line. And it will be given in such a way, the understanding will be given in such a way that you'll never escape it. It will never leave you. There's things that I have learned only through adversity that I would have learned no other way, but they are an integral part of me and I'll never forget them. But if I'd have got it all at one time, it probably would have escaped me. Now, let's go to James. And um, I want to point this out to you. We're going to look at it in context, James chapter 1. And I'm going to begin reading with verse 2, and we'll go down through verse 5. James chapter 1. We're going to begin with verse 2 and go through verse 5. Now, the Bible says, my brethren, he's talking here to the family of God, the household of faith. He said, my brethren... Count it all joy. Say that with me. Count it all joy. What kind of joy? All joy. When you fall into different trials. Now the word there is temptation, but if you'll go back and look at it, it says, my brethren, count it all joy when you find yourselves in different kinds of trials. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But, he says, but let patience have her perfect way. Let patience have her perfect work. That you may be perfect and entire, thorough, wanting nothing. Now look at verse 5. This is the one we always quote, but I want to put it in context with verse 2. It says in verse 2, my brethren, household of faith here, Count it all joy when you fall into different kinds of trials. Now, why? Because in verse number five, it says, if you lack wisdom when you're in different kinds of trials, let that person ask of God, and God will give to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavers is like a wave driven to the sea with wind and tossed. Let that, let that man not think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. So wisdom is tied in with divers trials and trying of your faith in verse 3 and then the episode that you must go through of letting patience have her perfect way so that you may be entire, thorough, wanting nothing. So wisdom comes by embracing adversity. You may be seated, and uh, I'm going to take my time this morning and get through with this. I want to empty my soul today on this subject. This is going to be the best message of the three, in my opinion, because I feel it in here. <clears throat> I feel this one in here real strong, this message real strong. How many of you was here for part one when I preached about Shimei? Let me see your hand. Well, I preached about Shimei and David. I wish I had time to go back and recap a little bit of that, but I don't have time at all to go back and touch on that because I've got too much to, ground to cover. Now, <clears throat> I don't understand why God allows Satan to try us but it's not for me to understand, it's just for me to, to accept the fact that God does. When God allows you and I to go through adversity, it has a, it has a purpose, and that purpose will only be recognized if you accept it and embrace it. But if you don't, <clears throat> what's going to happen if you resist what God has prescribed for you? If you resist it, you can spend your life stiffening your neck and hardening your heart to God's specific sandings, breakings, crushings, 
And you can get to the point where after a while you're just a cynical old man, just a, a cynical old woman. You never really learn much. You went through some stuff, you're bitter about them. You hate people. Uh, you're resentful about the being dished out what life dished out to you. The counsel that you give to other people is tainted with cynicism. Um, we hear the world say life is, a, and they use a bad word for it, life is a blank. That's people that has resisted adversity. That's people that has not gotten wisdom and derived wisdom from what they went through. And I know a lot of people in the ministry and otherwise, even in church pews, that has consistently resisted adversity that God allowed to come their way. And somehow there's something calloused about them and they're just the type of people that I don't really want to spend a lot of time around. But the ones that has accepted adversity and God has developed character in them and their integrity has been fortified they have something about them, they have a brokenness about them that I want to hear. They have experiences about them that I want to sit at their feet and I want them to tell me the stories and I want to learn what they learned. Now, in the Bible, the Bible says that it is written for our admonition. The scriptures, the Holy Scriptures are written for our admonition. And I'm going to go this morning, and I'm going to take you to three places. I'm going to take you to two places in the Old Testament, and I'm going to take you to one place in the New Testament, and I want to show you a principle about why sometime hell will fight you right before your greatest victories. Now, Hell has a clandestine information agency, Hell CIA. Let me say that again. Hell has a clandestine information agency where Satan gets his imps and demons and sends them out on assignments to study you, to study me, to study the work of God, to study churches, ministries, pastorates, and they study us, and because they are spirit, they're not omniscient, and they're not omnipresent. Only God is omniscient, all-knowing, and God is, only God is omnipresent, and only God is omnipotent. But Satan and his minions of demons are very busy, highly structured, highly focused, and tenacious as they can possibly be about either aborting the work of God from being consummated or when it is consummated to try to run it to the point that you can't enjoy it. Are you listening to me? He either wants to abort it and cut it off and ruin it, or if it does happen, he wants to so spoil it that you can't enjoy it. That's his purpose. In the ministry down through the years, I've never been a lazy person. I've always worked. I've always carried a burden on my heart for my churches that I pastored day and night. When I'm at my home, I've always got a, a phone in my hand, in my pocket, or on my person somewhere. I get a lot of telephone calls. I've always got a cell phone on me no matter where I am. At home, I have an extension phone that I carry with me. I get a lot of calls. I deal with a lot of situations, deal with a lot of trouble, and I deal with a lot of good, pleasant things also. But I have lived for the last 20 years wore out physically wore out. The last five years, it has only been the grace of God that has kept us all going, myself included. But day and night, day and night, day and night, 20, 18, sometime 18, 20 hours a day. And when I get an opportunity to get rest, when I get an opportunity to have peace, 
and to be by myself and to sit on a riverbank or to sit outside somewhere where I don't have anything pressing on me, maybe for a little while, hell does everything it can right before I get that time of rest to throw me in a tailspin where when I do have the time of rest, I can't rest. And whenever I do have the opportunity to have a good time with my family, such as Thanksgiving or Christmas, to have a protracted period of time to be with my family and my grandchildren, hell does everything it can to throw anything in a tailspin, in the church or whatever, to get me upset to where when I do have that time, I can't enjoy it. And then when I have to get back in the grind again, he lets up and he starts his other stuff again. And it, I'm not just talking about me. I'm talking to all these preachers in here shaking their head. It's them too. And not only is it us preachers, but it's you too. And I want to share something else with you. Listen, just about the time that God has a blessing that is about to come your way, I don't know how hell does it, but I believe that hell somehow can see it being formed and materializing. <clears throat> and just at the time when the blessing is about to happen and the prophecy is about to be fulfilled in your life that maybe you've held on to for years, just about the time it's to be fulfilled, you will undergo your most severe trial that you've ever undergone. And I've noticed that usually the intensity of the trial is usually proportionate with the intensity of what God is about to do in your life. You listening? So if you're going through a hellish situation and it's coming at you from every angle, it's probably indicative that something really powerful is about to transpire in your life. Now, listen to this. I want to tell you four things. I gave them to you in the beginning. I haven't talked about them in a couple of weeks, but let me just give you four things real quick. Now, listen, don't try to write these down. Just pick up a copy of the tape back there. Satan attacks you with a set of purposes in view. Whenever the devil goes to attack you, he is attacking you with a set of purposes in mind. Number one, he seeks to cause you to become offended with God. When the devil attacks you, when he comes against you and really fights you, Let's people talk about you, let you be slandered, let sickness come, let an accident happen, uh, let friends betray you. Whatever happens, the number one thing the devil's trying to do is to cause you to become offended with God, hurt with God. God, why didn't you save me from this? You could have stopped it. Why didn't you do that, Lord? He wants you to become offended with God. Number two, he seeks to end your fellowship with God by getting you to sin when offense comes. When offense comes, listen to me, everybody. When offense comes your way, when you get offended, that's when you're the most vulnerable to sin. Because when you get offended and hurt with God, see, we want to please God. And when you want to please God and walk close to him and in fellowship, you don't want to sin. But when you're offended with God, that's when hell broadsides you and says, well, he don't care about you anyway. Why don't you just go ahead and do this? See what I'm saying? Are you listening? I know you are. It makes a lot of sense. Number three, the devil seeks to halt development. When he attacks you, he's seeking to halt development of Christian character in you by tempting you to avoid that adversity or try to escape that adversity because that's the way character is developed in you. So when the devil attacks you, he's trying to get you to sin and fall off to the wayside because through that adversity, it's going to develop integrity in you. It's going to strengthen your integrity and it's going to develop character in you. So if the devil can attack you and get you to fall out to the wayside and you don't accept that adversity, but you become bitter over that adversity, then he has successfully worked his way in your life to halt the development of character in you. Number four, whenever the devil attacks you, he's seeking to prevent you from enjoying the fruit of overcoming that adversity. 
He's seeking to prevent you from enjoying the fruit. He's seeking to prevent you from having a testimony. He's seeking to prevent you from having a testimony. And one of the main reasons the devil does that is because if he can keep you from having a testimony, then he knows that by that testimony, you're going to encourage other people. And you're going to tell it to your children. And you're going to tell it to other Christians. And you're going to tell it to the world and people at work. And you're going to shine. And you're going to, it's going to show that God brought you through it. And you're going to just joyfully give God the glory. And the devil is seeking to keep you from enjoying the fruit of that adversity because he knows if you go through it successfully, you're going to have a testimony. And he doesn't want that. Now, I want to show you something. I want you to stay with me. Give me your best ear. And we're going to stay focused here for the next few minutes. But I want everybody to stay with me now. Listen closely. I'm not going to be long. David, go to 1 Samuel. David was grievously wronged and insulted. 1 Samuel, chapter 25. I love to hear pages turn. Now listen, I'm going to do something this morning I ordinarily don't do, but I'm going to read almost a whole chapter because by reading it, this is going to preach it better than I could preach it. I want you to see it. I don't even know if you've read this part of the Bible lately or not. Look this way, everybody. I don't know if you've read in this part of your Bible lately or not, but uh, I want you to go with me to Samuel, and I'm going to read almost a whole chapter. And in this chapter, I want you to see something, and don't ever forget this chapter. This is good. Don't ever forget this chapter in your Bible, because the next time you're going through hell, I want you to remember this chapter in your Bible, and I want you to highlight as I go through here, and after I read it, I'll come back and point out some things to you. But I want you to, point, I want you to underline some things here and remember this the next time you're going through an adversity and go back and consume and absorb this chapter again. Now, I'm going to be here in Samuel for a moment, then I'm going to Acts, and then I'm going to go back to 2 Samuel, and I'm going to show you three places in the Bible where right before the greatest victory came, these people went under some of the most severe attack of the devil. Now, let me ask you a question. Everybody look this way. How many of you have ever been through severe attack in your life? Let me see. Wow. So you know the devil too, don't you? How many of you, God has brought you through that severe attack? That's, that's the victory. How many of you have ever failed in a severe attack of the devil? I mean, hold your hand up. The rest of you is lying. <laughs> How many of you feel like at times that you've been successful and you've held your peace and come through it? Good. Okay. Now I'm going to go into Samuel right quick. And um, <clears throat> I want to show you something about Abigail and Nabal. In 1 Samuel 25, we're going to begin reading with verse 2. Now, the Bible says in chapter 25, verse 1, Samuel had just died, and all Israel was lamenting him, and he was buried in his house at Ramah. And David went down to the wilderness at Paran. Now, everybody look this way just for a minute and listen to these words. David had just buried the prophet of God. Samuel's dead. Samuel's the one that anointed him. Oh, my. I could stay right there for a little while. How many of you know the man of God, the prophet's the one that anointed him? Poured the oil over him, prophesied over him, and told him he's going to be the king of Israel. Remember that? Went to the house of Jesse to find him a king to anoint. You know what I found out? Listen closely. You know what I found out? Many times, God lets us live epoch times. The man of God anointed him. The prophet anointed him. 
spoke over him, prophesied over him. But now the man of God's dead. I have noticed at times whenever God gives us an epic word, a, a earth-shaking word, that sometimes that word will last for a long time without being fulfilled. But many times in the fulfillment of that word, there will come a series of things happening that will lead up to the fulfillment of that word. And sometimes it's the death or the division or the falling away of the one that gave you that word. And here's Samuel. He's the one that poured the oil over David. He's the one that prophesied over him. He's the one that God gave this powerful, impacting word to. Found that little ruddy-faced boy, shepherd. Samuel poured that oil over that boy, talked to him, blessed him, prophesied over him. And David began to excel and do great things, but then he began to be chased by Saul. Well, now Samuel's dead. That's strange. Samuel's died, people's lamenting him, and the Bible says David went down. He went down to the wilderness of Paran. Now I'm going to begin with verse 2. Look at this. It says, there was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel. Now, Carmel is a place where David had authority. There was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel, and the man was very great, and he had 3,000 sheep, and he had 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife was Abigail, and she was a woman of good understanding and of a beautiful countenance. But her husband, Nabal, was churlish and evil in his doings. And he was of the house of Caleb. And David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. David's sheep. David sent out ten young men, and David said unto the young men, Go up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name, and say to him that lives in prosperity, Peace be both to you and to your house and peace be to all that you have. Now I have heard that you have shearers, and that your shepherds which were with us, we didn't hurt them, neither was there any aught missing unto them all the while they were with us in Carmel. And ask the young men, David said, and they will show you. Wherefore, let the young men find favor in thine eyes. We come on a good day. This is a good day. We're not mad. Give, I pray, whatsoever cometh thy hand of your servants and of the son David. In other words, you sheared my sheep. Look this way. You sheared my sheep. Now, that was wrong. And you took the bounty. I want my money for you taking and stealing and shearing my sheep. You got the wool. So David said to these young men, now, when you approach them, it's a good day. Tell them it's a good day, and we're not here in, in anger and bitterness, but we want our money. Man of God wants his money. <laughs> so, where am I at? What verse? And when David's young men came, they spake to Nabal according to all the words in the name of David, and then they ceased. And Nabal answered David's servants. Nabal, now the Bible says the evil man. Listen to what he says. Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There is many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. Now look this way, and I'll explain to you what happened there. Saul had begun a smear campaign against David. Saul had gone on a campaign to absolutely ruin David's name because when those women, you know, blessed David and all that, and, and David was beginning to get acclaim and favor, well, David was, uh, Saul was trying to ruin his name, and so he's saying, who's this David? Yeah, I heard he broke away from Saul. I heard he broke away. See, Saul put that propaganda out. He said, yeah, I heard David broke away from Saul. Let me tell you one thing. David ain't getting nothing from me. Any man that's disloyal to his king, I don't care who he is. He ain't getting nothing from me, and I'll shear his sheep anytime I jolly well please. And so 
Verse 9 says, When David's young men came, they spake to Nabal, and Nabal answered in verse 10 and said, Who is David, who is the son of Jesse, that there be many servants nowadays that break away from Aaron his master? Shall I then take my bread and my water and my flesh that I have killed for my shears and give it unto men whom I don't know where they stand with a king? So David's young men turned their way, and they came again and told all those sayings. I imagine they did. Verse 13 says, And David said to his men, Gird every man on his sword. <laughs> Can't you just hear that? They said, in verse 12, look at this, I like this. It said, David's young men turned their way and came again and told David all the sayings. The Bible don't even say David thought about nothing. He just said, get your swords on. <laughs> and they girded on every man their sword. And David girded on his sword. And there went up after David about 400 men. And 200 stayed by the stuff. Now look this way. Can't you just get a picture of this? Here's the king putting on his sword, jumps up on his horse, says, who's going with me? 400 said, we'll go. We're going to teach these rascals a lesson. We're not only just going to get our wool, we're going to punch them out. <laughs> and so the Bible says, so David's young men turned their way. Oh, I'm sorry. About 200, moved by the stuff. Verse 14 says, one of the young men told Abigail, one of those young men went and told Abigail, Nabal's wife said, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master, and he railed on them. See, one of these, look this way. One of these good young men went back and told that old evil Nabal, told his wife Abigail, said, David, I don't think this is good. David came here in peace and said it was a good day and tried to be a gentleman and diplomatic and ethical. Boy, Nabal, Nabal didn't handle it right. He handled it in an evil way. And look what it said. It said in verse 15, the men were very good to us. We were not hurt, didn't miss anything as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the fields. And they were a wall to us day and night while we were there with them keeping the sheep. Now therefore know and consider what you will do for evil is determined against our master and against all of his household for he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. Then Abigail, look at this, Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready dressed and five measures of parched corn and a hundred clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on the donkeys. And she said to her servants, go on before me and behold, I'll come after you. But she didn't tell her husband Nabal. And so it was so as she rode on the donkey that she came down by the covert of the hill and behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met them. And David had said, Surely in vain have I kept all this that this fellow hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him, and he's requited me evil for good. Now jump over verse 22 and look at verse 23. When Abigail saw David, she hasted, lighted off the donkey, fell before David on her face, bowed herself to the ground, and fell at his feet and said, uh, and said, Upon me, my Lord, upon me let this iniquity be. And let your handmaid, I pray thee, speak in, the, in thine audience. And, and would you please hear the words of your handmaid? Let not my Lord, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. He's my husband. But I, your handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord whom you sent, and therefore my Lord as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing that the Lord is withholding thee from coming to shed blood and from avenging thyself with your own hand. Now let your enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. Now this blessing which thy handmaid has brought unto my Lord let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. And look at this, verse 28. This is so precious. She said, David, I pray thee, would you forgive the trespass of thy handmaid? She took the responsibility. For the Lord will certainly make David a sure house. Because my Lord fights, because David fights the battles of the Lord. And evil has not been spoken of you or found in you all your days. Yet a man is risen up to pursue you, David, and to seek your soul, but the soul of David 
shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. And the souls of your enemies, them he will sling out as out of the middle of a slingshot. And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you, David, and shall have appointed you ruler over all Israel, that this shall be no grief unto you. And I pray when all this is over that no offense of your heart unto my Lord, either that you have shed blood causelessly or that my Lord has avenged himself, but when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thy handmaid. Now look at this. David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me. Look at verse 33. I love this. He said, Blessed be your advice. And blessed be you, Abigail, which has kept me this day from coming to shed blood and from avenging myself with my own hand. Now look this way just for a minute. Let me explain to you what we just read. David said, get on your swords, we're going to kill. And as they're headed down, nostrils are flaring, tempers are hot. David said, how dare this reprobate do this to me. And as they're approaching, Abigail gets a bunch of gifts with her, raisins, all kinds of stuff. She loads down the donkey. She goes out and she meets 400 men and the king, and, and one man, David. Goes down and meets 400 men and David by herself. She says, oh, I, I pray you. She said, let, 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 let not the iniquity of your handmaid see. She's taking responsibility. And I know that had touched David's heart. And what she's saying to David is this. She's saying to David, I hadn't heard nothing evil about you. Matter of fact, all I've heard has been good about you. She said, but now I want to tell you something, son. You're about to make a wrong move here. You're about to avenge yourself. David, you're about to take things in your own hands, and you are about to be in a place where you're not going to let God fight your battles for you. And she said, now, David, when all this is over, I want you to listen to this, because I'm going to point you back to something in just a moment that's so powerful. She said, now, when all this is over, is it really worth you having a bad report come out against you, you taking things in your own hand, getting your spirit out of order, not letting God fight for you, and messing you up. She said, if you'll do what's right, God will take your enemies and put them in the middle of a patch like a slingshot, and he'll scatter your enemies away from you and take care of all your enemies if you'll let God fight your battles for you and if you have the right spirit. But she said, David, if you don't, grief is going to track you down like a hound. Now, I want to show you how things ended up. Watch this. I'm not going to read a whole bunch, but I want to just show you something. Watch this now. Where did I stop reading? Where? Verse 33. Let's go to verse 35. So David received of her hand that which she brought him. He received her sacrifices. And he said unto her, Go up in peace to your house. See, he said, I have hearkened to your voice, and I've accepted your person. And Abigail came to Nabal. Now look at this. I want everybody to look at this now. Listen closely. Listen closely. Son, find a seat back there, okay? It says, Abigail came to Nabal and said, Behold, he held a feast in his house, like the feast of a king, and Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk, Wherefore, she told him nothing less or more until the morning light came. Came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal. His wife told him these things, and look what it said. His heart died within him, and he became as a stone. It came to pass after ten days that the Lord killed Nabal. When David heard that Nabal was dead... He said, Blessed be the Lord that has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and has kept his servant from evil. For the Lord has returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. And David communed with Abigail and wanted to take her to be his wife. He liked her. 
he liked that offering she gave him, and he liked her sweet spirit. So oh, the old bad boy is dead, and so David said, I think I like you. <laughs> and so verse 40 says, When the servants of David were come to Abigail to Carmel, they said unto her, David has sent us to you to take you to be his wife. And she arose and bowed herself on her face to the earth and said, Behold, let your handmaid be a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. Now I want you to listen to something. Everybody look this way and listen. We'll go back to the Bible in just a moment, but I want you to listen to something. Look this way, everybody. Friend, right before, right before a victory in your life, hell will always put pressure on you to blow it. Now, let me give you a clear picture of what I've just read to you. Satan tried to get David to resist adversity, to take his sword and some soldiers and to settle this dispute the wrong way. So David was headed straight for spiritual failure. God raised up Abigail and used her as a female to go out and talk to that masculine mad heart. She came out, and he played right into her hands, and David listened to her. Here was a man, her husband, everybody look this way and listen. Her husband, Nabal, was on the verge of death anyway. Her husband, Nabal, was about to die. And the Bible said when she came back after appeasing David's anger, she didn't tell him nothing that night because he was drunk. He called a feast and got drunk, and she didn't tell him nothing. But when the morning light came, she went in and told him. She said, Nabal, you handle that situation wrong with David's young men. You sheared David's sheep. Whenever he sent, come in peace to you to try to make things right and to get his money. You handle it like a devil. You handle it like an evil man. And she said, Nabal, you did wrong. And the Bible said his heart turned to stone right there, and he became as a dead man. And 10 days later, he died. Now look at something important. Here's David on the verge of taking matters in his own hands. Here's David on the verge of about to do something very erratic, very wrong. And because God sent Abigail out and appeased David's anger, in less than 24 hours, the man was going to die anyway. But do you see how the devil was trying to suck David in to a man that was going to die anyway? Are you listening? Here's the devil trying to suck David in to a situation where a man was going to die anyway. And the devil wanted to get him involved in something with an evil man that was going to die anyway. And Abigail appeased him. And my God, within 24 hours, his heart turned to stone, and in 10 days, the man was dead. David almost blew it by the space of 10 days. Right at the verge of victory, that's when hell really enraged David. Now, let me show you something else. I'll come back in a moment. But go to Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11. I sense so strong in my heart. woo -wee. I sense this so strong in my heart. Those of you listening to me in the other buildings, listen closely. Give me your best ear. Those of you listening by television and those of you listening by tape, listen to this preacher. I can tell you by experience. I told these preachers uh, the other night when I spoke to the ministers at the pastor's conference, I told them I almost missed the angels. If I could have caught a bus, I'd have went home that night because I was hurting so bad. I almost missed the angels in 1965. And on a revival on Father's Day, I almost missed the Father's Day outpouring in my own church because I was still heavy about my mother's death and I was going through a lot of hell where the devil was attacking me and it felt like he just stuck a, pry, a crowbar in me and was trying to pry me out of here. I almost missed the revival. 
because I was going through such a terrible onslaught of hell. And I didn't know that that morning revival was going to break out and change everything. I didn't know that. Right on the verge, and I didn't know it. Sometime when we're right on the verge, are you listening? We're right on the verge of God doing something powerful. Hell will fight you tooth and nail and make you feel like nothing's ever going to happen. But you're right at the door of it. Look at this. This is interesting. In Acts chapter 11, this is a New Testament scripture. And I want to just give you another one. I could point out a lot of different scriptures to you, but I just want to give you another one in New Testament to show you what I'm talking about. Look in Acts 11 and 29. Acts 11 and 29. It said, Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which they did, and they sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James the brother of John with a sword, and because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also, then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to the four quarterings of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound in two chains. And the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, light shining in the prison, smote Peter on the side, raised him up. Get up quickly, he said. Chains fell off from him. Angel said, guard yourself, bind on your sandals. He did and cast his garment about him. And they went out and God delivered him. Now look this way. Go back to verse 11 and 29. It says, Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dealt in Judea, which they did, and they sent it by Barnabas and Saul. But now look in verse 12, or chapter 12, verse 1. It said, About that time, or in other words, meanwhile, Herod the king stretched forth his hand to kill the church. Now let me explain this to you. Everybody look this way and listen closely. God sent a prophet by the name of Agabus. He was a prophet. God sent a prophet by the name of Agabus in the early church to the church at Antioch. Agabus gave this prophecy. He said, famine's coming. It's going to be long. It's going to be bad. There's going to be shortage of food. He said, the brethren in Judea are going to suffer the most. So after the prophecy of Agabus, the Bible said the church at Antioch raised some funds and some, uh, some goods and they sent it all ahead to the church at, at Judea and they sent it by Barnabas and Saul. And while relief was on the way, read that in your Bible, while relief was on the way, Look at this. Look at this, everybody. While relief was in route, hell anointed Herod to vex the church. Now look this way, everybody. I want you to look at me. Don't miss this. This is important. Don't let the devil put you to sleep this morning. Listen to me. You're going to need this. I feel this is prophetic. He said, while relief was on the way at the hands of Barnabas and Saul, and they were carrying the money and the goods to the church at Judea because Agabus prophesied famine and droughts coming. While the relief was en route, I want to tell you this morning, there's some things that God has for you that's en route. I said there's some things God has for you that is en route. Relief, relief is on the way. The Bible said while the relief was on the way, God let us see. The Bible said it's written for our instruction. We have insight here into the devil's strategy. Hell and Satan himself anointed Herod. And Herod rose up and arrested James and killed him. 
You know why I believe he arrested him? Because I don't know how much the church was praying right then because evidently the church wasn't praying right then. They was caught up in the miracles and the signs and the wonders and they quit praying for a while. Because the Bible does say when they arrested Peter, the church started praying. All of a sudden he nabbed James and killed him. While relief was on the way, the devil anointed Herod to go ahead and just try to intimidate the living daylights out of them. So when the relief did come, it wouldn't mean nothing. God's got blessings on the way to you, and the devil knows they're going to be such a great blessing to you. But the devil is trying to spoil those blessings before you ever get your hands on them. And it's almost like after you get your hands on them, it's secondary because hell has just blasted you so hard. It's like, oh, here's the relief. I hate the devil. I hate the devil. I don't use that word. My mom always taught me, don't you say, son, you ever hate anybody. Well, mama, I hate the devil. Amen. I hate him. Here's God's got some good things on the way to us, friend. God's got blessings, and the devil sees those blessings forming. Satan saw that relief on the way to the saints in Judea. He was trying to make everybody suffer, especially the church. But now here all of a sudden comes money, and here all of a sudden comes food. And hell hated it. And so the devil anointed Herod, and Herod rose up and began to persecute. I want to warn you of something. Whenever persecution begins to break out, it's a sure sign that relief is on the way. Let me say that again. I said when persecution comes and the devil starts hammering you and pounding you and pounding you and intimidating you, it is a pronouncement from heaven that relief is on the way. Hallelujah. And the devil anointed old Herod, he jumped up and got a hold of James and killed him. Unusually strong vexation. The Bible said he began to vex the church. Look at it in verse 12. Now about that time, meanwhile, while relief was on the way, the Bible said. While relief was on the way, chapter 12, verse 1, about that time, meantime, not about that time, but in the meanwhile, at the same time, relief was on the way, Herod the king stretched out his hands to vex certain of the church. Hell will vex you and that strong vexation is often a sign of approaching blessings. Remember this. Get this in your mind and let the Holy Ghost blazon it in your heart right now. Vexation equals soon coming blessings. Vexation equals relief is on the way. How many of you remember Daniel in the Bible? The Bible said when Daniel was praying down by the river, he wasn't eating any pleasant meat, 21 day fast, seeking God, calling on God. The Bible says God had the answer on the way to him, but all of a sudden while Daniel began to pray, 21 days elapsed, Michael broke forth from a major battle, turned the rest of the battle over to some other angels. Michael is the warring archangel for Israel. Michael broke free, came to David down by the river and said, David, whew, thank God you kept praying, boy, because your prayers kept us fighting. And I broke free just long enough to tell you, keep on praying, son, because relief is on the way. And you're praying... And hell, seeing the relief that was on the way, caused the prince of Persia to get all riled up. And we've been fighting him, but you go back to doing what you was doing. I'll go back to doing what I was doing. And hang on, relief is on the way. Woo! Oh, church of God, listen to me. I tell you, the blessings and relief is right at your door. The devil may be telling you, you'll never do it. You'll never make it. You're not going to win. The church won't do anything. Your ministry won't do anything. It's never going to happen. He is a bald-faced liar. <laughs> he is a liar. A 
a mission of mercy by Saul and Barnabas, and then Herod's vicious attack. And they both occurred simultaneously. What happened in the Old Testament? David going to kill a man that was going to die anyway the next day. Think about it. He's all riled up. I believe hell knew Nabal was going to die the next day. Evidently he went to coma or something. Didn't die until 10 days later. But hell stirred David up. Go get him, boy. Go get him. Go get him. And if David would have obeyed that voice, that command, that, that push, if David would have obeyed that, he would have aborted his blessing. And Abigail came to him with all these gifts, and she said, Oh, king, it's not worth it. And man, the next day, whew, it was over anyway. Let me give you one more, and I close. I want to show you something about David at Ziglag, and I close after this one. First Samuel, chapter 30. Woo, I feel the Lord. Man, I feel the Lord so strong this morning. I don't know who it's for, but I can tell you it's for somebody. Hold your finger there. In 1 Samuel chapter 30, and go back and look with me one more time. I'm going to take a few minutes to do this. Go back to chapter 12 of Acts. I want to show you a powerful truth. Just hold your finger there in chapter 30 of 1 Samuel, but go back to Acts chapter 12, and while you hold your finger there, take the third finger and go to Psalms 109. Psalms 109. I want to show you a powerful truth. This is an eye opener, friend. Powerful truth. And I don't want you to ever forget it. Acts chapter 12 now look this way, everybody. What happened now? The Bible said, Agabus prophesied, famine's coming. Saul and Barnabas heads out with relief to the church at Judea. While they're headed that way, relief is on the way. The devil anoints Herod. He reaches out, starts persecuting and vexing the church. Now, what happened whenever the church started praying, we find in Acts chapter 12, verse 5, it says, Therefore Peter was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Look this way, everybody. Listen to this statement. When you're going through hell, the devil tries to fix it to where the last thing you want to do is pray. Are you listening? What you want to do is go to bed. Pull the covers up. Shut the lights out. Try to sleep it off. The devil wants you to get offended. He wants you to get mad. He wants you to get hurt. He wants you to have a pity party. All these things. The last thing he's hoping you're going to do is what you ought to do, and that's pray. The Bible said they killed James. Oh, that sent fear and shock waves throughout the whole early church. Oh, James is killed. Oh, my God. Now they've got Peter. Oh. And so the Bible says that they didn't go into depression. They didn't go into a pity party. They didn't go into neutral, but they gathered up the reins of whoever they were, pulled them up, got themselves by the bootstraps, pulled them up, and says, we're going to pray, bless God. You know what the Bible said they did? They prayed, and all of a sudden, because they prayed and did the right thing, whenever adversity came, God sent an angel and gave a miracle. Look at Psalms. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Devil, we are not going to bow down to you. Shoot. I tell you, we are not going to bow down to you. We're not going to fall for your stupid, deceptive tricks. We're going to rise up in the name of the Lord and pray and seek the face of God. We're tired of your shenanigans. I said, we're tired of your shenanigans. Get 
getting me worked up here. Get your sword on, folks. Yeah. Mad as fire. Psalms 109, verse 1. This is David now. Look this way just a minute before we read this. Let me tell you about him. Y'all remember a while ago, Abigail came to him, had on that sword and said, I'm going to take care of business. Now he's older. He's wiser. Why don't you look what he says in verse 1. Hold not thy peace, O God, of my praise. For the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful are open against me, and they've spoken against me with a lying tongue. They compassed me about also the words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. For my love, they are my adversaries. But I give myself unto prayer. You know what the devil's doing to churches all over this nation? He's working them up into a lather. He's working them up, persecuting them, afflicting them, attacking them, and they're falling for it. They're getting hurt. They're getting offended. Revival tries to break out in a church here. Revival tries to break out in a church there. People get all worked up. People start leaving the church, start attacking the preacher. Preacher starts attacking the church, and the devil said, ha, 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 no revival here. But David said, I will give myself to prayer. I'm going to voice my words in my prayer closet, not against my brother. Let me tell you something, friend. When hell attacked that early church through Herod, Herod was only the emissary. He was only the earthly vessel, but Satan was behind it. And I want to tell you something else. Whenever you begin to go after God, there's going to be people that hell will anoint and use to come against you, but the devil is behind all of it. He's behind it. Satan is behind their words. Satan is behind their eyes. And don't fight the person. Because after the attack's over, the person won't even hardly know what the devil did through them. And here you've got an enemy. Go right after the devil. David said, when all these things are happening against me, he said, I'm not going to roll over and play dead. I'm not going to get depressed. And I'm not going to react because Abigail came to me. I'm going to give myself to prayer. Oh, friend, hear me. When you are vexed, when you are vexed, when you're under attack, the last thing that you feel like you can muster in your energy to do is to pray. I've been so vexed before. I've been under such attack before. It was almost all I could do to get my voice above a whisper and say, Jesus friend, I want to ask you, what else are you going to do? There is no help in any other. Let your Job's comforters come to you. It's only going to make matters worse. I don't want no Job's comforters. Whenever you're under attack, one of the last things you want to do, you want to do everything else but give yourself to prayer. Man, I could say so many things right here, but I got to hurry. I'm going to quit. I've been going an hour. Been going an hour. I better quit. I'll preach one more part. How's that? Preach one more part. Hallelujah. I want you to stand with me this morning. Just want you to lift your hands and begin to worship God for 30 seconds. Don't ask Him for a thing. Just tell Him you love Him. Lift your voice and begin to praise Him. Jesus, we love you. Father, we worship you. Oh, hallelujah. Jesus. Come on, praise Him. Praise Him.
I want you to listen to me for a minute. I'm sorry, John. I took your time here, brother. Just you had a burst of meanness come on me. <laughs> listen, as you know, in January, we're going to start our first prayer crusade. It's going to be a little rock. And by the way, choir, I want all of y'all to go and I'll pay your way. If you'll go, I hadn't even talked to Lyndall about it. <laughs> Lyndall, let's take the choir if they'll go, if they get off from work, and I'll pay the transportation over there. Okay? Huh? We'll get a couple of buses and take them over there. If y'all go, yeah. we'll have a... Hallelujah. We'll pay. We're going to have our first prayer crusade, but I want everybody to mark something in your book. Hear me. This is what God was dealing with me about yesterday, and this is what birthed the sermon. The Lord spoke to me, and he said, Son, you're going to start these prayer crusades. You're going to wade out in the devil's territory. He said, While relief is on the way to those cities, in the form of you and Lyndall Gowen taking that choir and hundreds of Brownsville people that will go with us. I want you to go with us. If you can go, I want you to go with us. I need all the intercessors I can get. Nothing would thrill me more for you to make up a third or a fourth or a half of those prayer meetings wherever we're going in these different states. I want you to go with me. This is not a John Kilpatrick thing. This is not a Partners in Revival thing. This is a Brownsville thing. And I'm going to be responsible for it financially. And God's going to have to help us, and he will help us, and he'll bless us. But I want you to go, and I want the choir to go. We prayed, all of us, we prayed before God sent revival to Brownsville. And now the Lord's speaking to my heart. It's a fresh word. It's burning. I can't hardly sleep. I can't hardly be still. These, these, these things are burning so in my spirit about going to cities and prayer crusades. God is going to do something. He's going to turn cities upside down. I feel it. Woo! I said I feel it. I feel that God's going to turn cities upside down. But, listen, but don't lose sight of the fact while relief is on the way in the form of you in a bus traveling over there and me on the way over there, Linda on the way over there, and you on the way over there, don't lose sight of the fact that there's going to be a Herod somewhere that the devil's going to try to anoint, to intimidate us, and to break our spirit. But I have made up my mind. Listen, listen. I have made up my mind that the devil is not going to have the cities of America. Listen. If God could send revival because of prayer to Brownsville, I say God can send it to a whole city. Pensacola included. The Lord spoke into my heart and he said, Son, leave Pensacola to those that I'm raising up. I will take Pensacola through those that I'm raising up here. But he said, I've laid my hand on you to leave out of Pensacola and to go take it to the cities. And he said, I'll anoint you there. But I've raised up other men. And I, I've got some men in, I, in mind who God's raising up to do it. And some of them's not even assemblies of God. Oh, blow me away. <laughs> God's raising them up. They've got a vision. They've got a passion. They've got a burden already. But God, if he can take a church, he can take a city. If he can take a city, he can take the nation. Listen, some of you, the devil's going to come on you strong. And the devil's going to say to you, why don't you start criticizing Pastor Kilpatrick? He ought to be staying here at Brownsville. He ought not to be going out gallivanting all over the country. He ought to be here every single service. He ought to be here on Wednesday night. He ought to be here on Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. We're going to work all day long. That's what he ought to be doing. And the devil's going to tempt some of you to really start blasting me and criticizing me and finding fault and saying, he don't need to be out there doing all this stuff. Well, I tell you, friend, it's not a matter of what I want to do or what you want me to do. It's what God's calling me to do. Do you listen? Hell is going to begin to attack this church. I sense it. I want you to be prepared. 
Why don't you go ahead now and get a quilt from the head down to your sandals. Get your feet shod. Hell's going to attack you. There's going to be some Herod's rise up. And the Herod's are going to try to attack us because we're bringing relief. But I've got news. We don't learn from the Bible. God said, I wanted you to know how the devil works. Well, we know. Now's the time to start praying. So that as we go and bring relief to these cities, God will give us favor, raise up the valleys, pull down the mountains, make straight the path of the Lord. And that God will mute those bull demons and those powers and principalities and let us go in right under their noses with them muzzle with, with construction tape over their mouth and chains behind their back. And they just have to watch us say, <laughs> Now's the time. I said, now's the time. Come on, lift your hands, lift your hands, lift your voice, hallelujah. Come on, praise him, all over the building, praise him. It's time, folks, it's time for revival to spread. Give God the praise, revival will spread all over this land. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory, 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 glory. Come on, you're too quiet, lift your voice and praise him. the devil a black eye this morning. A hundred thousand didn't come in, but a hundred and twelve thousand came in. Can you say glory? Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! Glory, glory, glory. Ah, come on, give the Lord praise. It's time to celebrate. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Jesus. I want you to look this direction, listen very closely. And ladies and gentlemen, it's been the privilege of mine just to walk behind John Kilpatrick and walking behind him, the blessings of the Lord have come on my life and our ministry greater than ever before. And God told me, said, I want you to put him first. You put him before, before your ministry because I chose him. Just together as boys, I chose him. I chose you to follow behind. And I'm privileged to do that because not only is God blessing us, but the revivals we're having are tremendous. But one of the greatest frustrations of our life has been we haven't seen this thing spread like it needs to spread. It's coming. Now hold your applause. Listen close. Steve Hill's the greatest evangelist I've ever known. I would shine his shoes, wash his feet, carry his attache case. God's called him to awake America. And thousands multiply thousands are repenting. But still, the revival is not spreading. Because you see, revival doesn't spread because of good preaching or because you have great crusades. Revival spreads because when you lay that track through prayer and fasting, God looks down and says that track is laid and a Holy Ghost train is going to come down that track. And churches are calling, but the reason we don't answer the calls is because the track ain't laid. Somebody has to lead the way in this nation to lay that track. And God has chosen our pastor, John Kilpatrick, and this church, this church to stand behind him and say, revival came to Brownsville, not because of Linda Cooley's ability, John Kilpatrick's ability, Steve Hill's preaching, Revival came to this church because there's a group of people that made up their mind. We're going to press through and hone in on heaven and touch God and bind the powers of darkness. And we're going to pray till the bottom drops out of heaven. And devil, you can't stop us in the name of Jesus. It's still not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. That's why revival's here. There's something in this atmosphere I sense nowhere else. And I'm out there all the time. I'm flying tomorrow, South Carolina. Something in this atmosphere. What is it? that makes you want to crawl on your face and fall and repent. Whether it's Steve Hill preaching or a five-year-old preaching. And I'm not minimizing Steve's ability. Whether it's Lindell's worship or Mike's worship or the choir or whoever. It's not about man. This revival is about Jesus Christ and the body of Christ. No denomination will lay claim to it. 
It's going to leap across nominational barriers. Smoke clears, dust settles. You're going to see the body of Christ united as one man with one voice. And we're going to be revived. It's going to be a glorious church. And while we're shouting the praises of God, the trumpet's going to sound. And Jesus is coming back for a glorious church. Get ready, folks. It's going to happen. I'm going to ask you two things. Number one, I want you to pray for John Kilpatrick like you've never prayed before. Hold him up in prayer. Don't even entertain any criticism, any negative talk by anybody. I know that's not here, but I know the devil knows relief is on the way, and so he will try to vex the church. Make up our, in fact, throw your hands up right now. I want you to cover our pastor and his wife. I want you to cover them right now with a canopy of prayer. Jesus. Jesus, encapsulate John and Brenda Kilpatrick in a bubble of your grace. Father, we stand behind them. We walk with them. Courage them. Satan, we rebuke you and we go ahead and we cancel your assignment against them, against these prayer crusades. We rebuke the powers of hell. We release that river anointing that's flowed in Brownsville for five years to go to Arkansas. And all over the nation, they shall see the sights and hear the sounds of Holy Ghost revival. In the name of Jesus, what we've just done, do every day, every day. Students, Brownsville people, listen. This is how the revival is going to spread, through prayer. Lila shook her head a few moments ago when I talked about the spreading of this revival. I could stay busy the rest of my life just going out telling the story of this revival. But God don't just want to tell the story of this revival. For God to do what needs to be done in America, he has to raise up Brownsvilles all over this nation. How many knows it's going to happen before Jesus comes? It's going to happen. The second thing I'm doing before chaplain comes, pastor talked about it. By the way, it goes without saying, but this is a masterpiece. The best message I ever heard him preach because he preached it from his heart. It came from his soul. God had me here today. He's had you here today. Maybe you've blown it. Right before your greatest victory, you're getting so close, but all hell is a raid and attack against you. And maybe you've blown in some areas. You've let down your guard, begin to criticize. You've done some things. I remember I called Steve Hill when I was teaching at a school in Fort Worth on giving an altar call. I said, Steve, give me some pointers. He said, John, never assume. Tell the people, number one, never assume. Never assume just because... Brother Fred shouted all over the church last Sunday that he's ready for heaven this Sunday. Saturday night, he could have been watching pornography all night, falling into a trap of Satan. And so the thing I love about this great revival, every service, we give you the opportunity to get all the junk out, to come clean and clear with God. The blood of Jesus will never cover what you don't uncover. You say, I'm a Christian. You say, I'm an assembly of God. God don't see those titles. He sees hearts. How I many does God just sees hearts? So all he sees today is hearts. He don't see the name over a door when he walks in. Get ready, folks. The revival that's spreading out of here will go into all kinds of churches because he sees hearts. And I want you to humble your heart right now in the presence of God. I don't even want you to close your eyes. I want you to hold your head high. And I'm asking for judgment day honesty. If there's somebody here you've never known the Lord. This is your time to meet God. God brought you here for such a time as this. If you're a backslider, that means if there's a time in your life when you were closer to God than you are today, you backslid that much, and God brought you here to repent. If you're a Christian, but you say, John, as pastor was preaching, God showed me right before my greatest blessing, I've blown it. Maybe this past week in a relationship, spirits of bitterness, hate, animosity, anger, whatever, maybe lust has come back and seized your head, and you say, devil... I'm not going back to that rot. I'm not going back to the mud. I'm going to stay in the flood of Holy Ghost revival. And if you'll be honest, the blood of Jesus will never cover what you don't uncover. But if you'll be honest, the blood of Jesus will cleanse you from all sin. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'll say, John Davis, there's junk in me, there's sin in me, and I need to repent. I'm going to count to three. When I hit that number three, I want you to raise your right hand. The balcony, the main floor, the other buildings. Watching my television, this is your day to get the junk out. In a few moments, we're going to partake of the eternal emblems of his suffering, holy communion. But before then, we need to repent. John Davis, there's sin in me. I want God to take it out. One, two, three. If I'm talking to you, raise your hand. All over this building, in the balcony, across the street, the other buildings, lift your hand high. And I want you to hold it there for just a moment. 
Now lift your other hand. Those that are watching by television, wherever you're watching this, I want you to lift both hands right now in the living room, motel room, and we're going to pray a prayer. I want everybody in this building to join with the hundreds that have their hands in the air and just lift your hands together. And I want us to pray this prayer of repentance. Say these words out loud. Dear God, I love you. I really do. Because you first loved me right now. In the name of Jesus, I confess, I repent. I ask you, forgive me for all my sins, the bad I've done, the good I haven't done. Set me free from all iniquity. I believe your word. I receive your word. I obey your word according to your word. You cannot lie. As I pray this prayer right now, all of my sins are under the blood, behind your back, in the sea, forgiven, forgotten, forever. I'm right with God, ready for heaven. I'm ready to live. I'm ready to die. I'm ready for revival. Satan, hear me good. Get out of my head, out of my heart, out of my home. In the name of Jesus, I'm free. I'm free. And I shout it. I shout it. I shout it. Thank you, Jesus.